Well, take God's Word and turn with me to one of my favorite verses. I hope it'll be one of your favorite verses if you don't already know it. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. I won't go into all that. But anyway, I had to learn that song to figure out the the order of the Old Testament Bible. But uh, Isaiah wrote more about Jesus than anybody else in the whole Bible in the Old Testament. And Isaiah 41.10, I want to talk to you about God holds you in His hand. Say that with me. God holds you in His hand. You're not holding on to God if you know Jesus. He's holding on to you. And that's a very encouraging thought, is it not? We live in a stressful day. People spend too much time on their cell phones, too much time on social media, too much time on news. We have access to more news and so much of it is sensationalized. I mean, everything's extreme. Everything's either the worst or the best than it's ever been before. How do you know? You weren't alive 100 years ago. It might have been way better back then than it is now. Or way worse. Depends on where you were in the world. But nowadays, everything is so sensationalized. And we worry. We worry about inflation. Prices are going up. But you know what? They've been going up for 40-something years. When I was a kid... Do you know how much gasoline cost? 29 cents a gallon. You say, well, you're as old as dirt. (laughs) Maybe. But I can remember pulling up the gas station and taking out my empty milk jug. (laughs) They put you in jail for doing that now, I guess. But uh, filling it up, putting it on the back of my little mower and go out mowing yards. I thought, 29 cents? I only get $4 for a yard. They're going to break me. Well, you know, don't you wish it was 29 cents now? Yeah. Well, what are we going to do? Just worry all the time, talk bad all the time, be stressed all the time? I'm not going to. Well, I'm just so stressed about the presidential election. Well... I tell you what, we've been stressed a long time about all that. I remember back in 1976, and that's the first time I ever got to vote for the president. And then in 1980, 1984, every year, every four years, they said the same thing. Oh, the the country's in the worst state it's ever been. Well, that can't be because they said it four years ago. That can't be. They said it eight years ago. They said it 40 years ago. You keep, you say, well, you're old. Well, keep breathing, you'll get there. And what you realize is everything is sensationalized. That's how people get you to buy their products. That's how people get you to watch their ads. They make it like everything is worse now than it's ever been. Well, I don't buy it. Now, I know that some people, you know, I know that we struggle with things. We struggle with racial division. I get that. Political polarization. I just have to believe, though, if politics could fix us, we'd already be fixed because we've gone back and forth from Democrat and Republican all my life. And you know what? We're still kind of messed up, okay? (laughs) Are you being blessed so far? Are you just really getting into this encouraging sermon by your pastor? News, oh my soul, talks about the worst thing all the time. There's fear and discouragement everywhere you look. But I've got something, let me make that different. I have someone named Jesus who has changed my life. He didn't just change my life. He changed the way I think. And I'm not going to let the world tell me how to think. I'm going to let the Word tell me how to think. And I'm going to give you a amen. Give God praise on that. Yeah. 
And I'm telling you, you don't have to believe the devil's lies. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in discouragement. You don't. You say, well, I'm a realist. No, you're just looking at your cell phone too much. You're looking at that more than you are the Word. You're spending more time listening to what CNN says and Fox News says and what the Republicans say and what the Democrats say and all that stuff. And you're all tied up like a knot on the inside. Man, I'm not saying don't ever know what's going on. But just realize it's all laced. It's all laced with different shades of prejudice. Don't listen to it. Get your foundation here. Spend time in the Word. And let God take the fear and the discouragement away. Now, would you read with me our verse? I can remember learning this when I was about 20, let's see, 23 years old. I was at Southwestern Seminary. I'd started a scripture memory class. It was my second one. And uh, I came to this verse and I said, my, oh my, where have you been? Isaiah 41, 10. Let's read it together. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's give him praise right now. Amen. I want to talk to you today about God holds you, your hand, holds you in his hand. He holds you in his hand. Now, you know, when you preach somewhere almost 20 years, they've heard all your stories. So I'll just go ahead and tell it like you've never heard it. We were out Christmas shopping. One day I was with my mother. She was shopping. And uh, we were downtown Dyersburg. And that's back when all the stores were downtown. Does anybody remember downtown? That's all gone now. It's all online. But anyway, we were downtown shopping. And I, was, I remember we were crossing over from J.C. Penney going by the bank. And I guess... My mother had spent all her money in J.C. Penney. She needed some more money from the bank, I guess. I don't know. But she grabbed me by the hand. And uh, I felt like she had grabbed the whole right side of me. She grabbed me from here to here, I felt like. I thought, my soul, the woman's going to, she's got a hold of me. And I said, Mom, let me just hold your hand. She said, no way. No way. I said, why? She said, because when I get out there in the middle of the road, I know you. You'll let go. And you're liable to get run over. And I love you. And I'm not, you're not going to hold on to me. I'm going to hold on to you. Amen. 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 Well, for a long time, almost 50 years, I've not been holding on to God. God's been holding on to me. If I held on to God, I'd let go sometimes. I don't like some of the things that I go through. I'd let go, but praise the living God. He won't let go, amen? He won't let go. <laughs> amen. I'm about to preach myself happy, amen, all right. Number one. But God holds you by his hand, you can experience God's presence. You know, when you're holding somebody's hand, you experience their presence, don't you? Well, when you hold God's hand, or rather when he holds your hand, you'll experience his presence. Do not fear, read it with me now, for I am with you. I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you. I'm your God. I'm with you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of any human being. 
You say, Brother Steve, there's bad people out there. Oh, I know there's bad people out there. There's always been bad people out there. But you know what? You got God. Amen. He's holding you. You don't have to be afraid of all the bad people out there. Well, Brother Steve, the devil's out there. The demons are out there. You don't have to worry about that. Jesus Christ has already defeated the devil. Jesus Christ has already defeated every demon. You don't have to fear that stuff. When you lay down in a, at home at night, you say, I'm all alone. You're not alone? Alone? What are you talking about? You're not alone. You're never alone. Jesus is with you. He'll protect you. From bad folks, he'll protect you. From demons, you say, well, I've got a sickness. I know how you feel. <laughs> I've got a disease. I know how you feel. But you know what? That's okay. Jesus is bigger than cancer. Jesus is bigger than disease. Jesus is bigger than sickness. He's bigger. He's more mighty. Well, I've got stuff in my past. I've got stuff in my trunk. I've got stuff that I'm dealing with right now that's really hard. I've got stuff in my future that I'm afraid of. You know, that's us, is it not? We're looking back. Oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Looking there. Oh, I wish I wasn't doing this. Oh, I'm afraid of the future. Aren't you glad that God is behind you? God is with you, and God's already gone before you. He'll take care of it. Amen? Amen. God's with you, His presence. Well, there's a story about three boys. Their parents had been killed by the Babylonians, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar took them and some of the other wisest young men back to Babylon. And they went back to Babylon, and they started learning the Babylonian language, and they started helping with the emperor, and they really did a good job. They accelerated, and their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were accompanied by a guy named Daniel. One of the greatest books in the Bible is Daniel. And by the way, he talked more about the coming of Christ than anybody else in the Old Testament. And the Bible says he was a great man of God, and so was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, Nebuchadnezzar got full of himself, not of God, but of himself. And he made this 90-foot statue of himself. Now, don't get so mad at him. I know a lot of people that make big idols out of themselves. Hey, look at me. Nebuchadnezzar was no big deal, and neither are you, and neither am I. The only big deal is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. We're all just a bunch of folks. And we need the Lord. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar was about to find that out. So he made this 90 foot statue, gold of gold. I'm talking about pure gold. He said, all right, everybody listen now. When everybody, when you hear the music, when you hear all the trumpets and all that stuff, you got to bow down and worship this idol of me. Well, the music came. Everybody knelt down except for four people. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't know where Daniel was. He wasn't with these other three right now. But some of the folks looked up and they went to the king and said, hey, didn't you tell everybody about that? Yes, I did. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not doing what you said. He pulled them up there. He said, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. You're going to be burned up. They looked at him and said, you know what? If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. But even if he does not. We're not going to worship your golden image. And we're not going to bow our knee before you. You're just a man. Ooh, he got hot. And when he got hot, 
the fiery furnace got hot. Now, I don't know how in the world you can make fire seven times hotter. I mean, fire is hot. Amen? How many ever touched fire just for a second? You won't touch it long, I'll tell you that. How in the world he did that, I don't know. But he just stoked it up and got it going. And he threw those boys in there. He tied them up, threw them in there. He said, I'll teach you. Well, no, they were about to teach him. They looked down in that furnace. And those boys were up standing around walking. I think they were going, na, 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 boo, boo. Na, 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 boo, boo. We won't bow down to you. We won't bow down. That's not in the Bible, but I have to believe there was something like that going on. I got a holy imagination. And he looked down there and he said, hey, y'all. That's West Tennessee Bible right there. Hey, y'all. Look down there. Didn't we put three people in there? Yeah. Well, I see them. Didn't we bind their hands and their feet? Yeah. Well, I see them walking around in the fire. And their clothes are not burning up. And there's one of them in there that looks like the Son of God. He ran down to the fire and said, Hey, come out. Everybody came out but Jesus. You don't tell Jesus what to do. Jesus tells you what to do. So he sent his boys out. Go on out there, boys. He's talking to y'all. They went out, and he looked at them. Their clothes had not been burned. Their hair had not been burned. Their face had not been burned. Hands had not been burned. Now listen, God was showing out, and they didn't even smell like smoke. I can get within 50 yards of somebody cooking ribs, and I'll smell like ribs the rest of the day. Amen? I get that smoke on me, Charles. They didn't even smell like smoke. And the Bible says, he bowed down his head and said, your God is the God. And he worshiped the Lord. I think God said to those boys in that fire, do not fear. I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you. Don't look at the fire. Look at me. I don't think they even looked at the fire. I think they looked at Jesus the whole time. They were not alone in the fire. Some of you are sick. God's presence will hold you and give you healing. Some of you are discouraged. God's presence will hold you and bring you courage. Some of you are lost your job. God's presence will hold you, calm you down. And God's presence will get you another job. Maybe God wanted to move you out of that job. Because he's got something better for you. Maybe you're lonely. God's presence will be closer to you than a brother. Maybe you've gone through a divorce. God's presence will hold you up and turn that bitter experience into something sweet down the road. Some of you have lost a loved one. God's presence will hold you He'll help you walk until you see them again in heaven. Don't fear. God is with you. Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you pass through the water. Everybody say through. Through. We're passing through the waters. I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you won't be scorched. Nor will the flame burn you. Instead of living in fear, live in faith. Instead of being down, pray and walk with God. The Lord of hosts is with us. I, Psalm 46, 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Because God holds you in his hand, you can experience God's presence. I'd rather have the presence of God in a trial than not to have the presence of God and not have a trial. Number two, because God holds your hand, Christian, 
you in his hand, you can experience God's promises, God's promises. And just like a rapid fire, he gives three promises right in the middle of the verse. Here they are. Don't miss them now. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you. Read it out with me. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you. Now I'm going to be with you. But I'm not going to just stand around and do nothing. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to make you brave. You're not going to be a coward. You're not going to be afraid. You're going to be bold and strong. I, the Lord, my, your God, is with, I'm with you. I'll help you. I won't just strengthen you. I'll help you. I'll be your support. I'll uphold you. I'll grasp you like my mother grasped me going across that road in Dyersburg. You're not holding on to me. Jesus said, I'm holding on to you. So I promise you, I'll strengthen you when you're weak. I'll help you when you're hurting. I'll uphold you when you can't stand up by yourself. God's promises. The Bible says, in fact, this is such a great verse. I want to read it out of the New Living Translation, but I want you to read it with me off the screen. Luke 6, 38. Would you read it with me, please? Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Read that last part again. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. How many of you believe that? Well, you know you got to hold your hand up because it's in the Bible. But do you believe it down in here? Look at me. Do you believe it right here? I said, do you believe it right here? If God doesn't own your money, God doesn't own you. Money's just a tool. And it's not going to last. When you see somebody in a casket and somebody said, how much did he leave? Just say, all of it. <laughs> it's not going to last. It's not going to last. I was doing a funeral one time and somebody in the family handed me a little note and it had an honorarium in it. That means there was a check in there. And I got home and opened it up, read the note. And I looked at the check. And as soon as I looked at the check, as soon as I looked at the check, the Holy Ghost said to me, that's not for you. That's not for you. I want you to give it to somebody else. I said, yes, sir, private gains reporting for duty. Everything I've got is yours. My soul is yours. Anything I've got in the bank is yours. My body is yours. I'm yours. So you got all my money, Lord, whatever you want. So I went and cashed a check. Does anybody remember cashing a check? Why didn't you just Venmo? <laughs> I carried that money around with me for a couple of weeks. And then one day, the Spirit of God has told me it's as clear as a bell. Give it to that guy. So I gave it to him. Later on, he would tell me, as soon as you handed that to me, that money, the Lord told me, that's not for you. He said, okay, Lord. I'll just carry this money around. It's yours anyway. And whenever you want me to give it to somebody, you tell me. 
and I'll do it. About two or three weeks later, there was a lady. She was a single mom. God bless the single moms. Let's give God praise for single moms right now. I don't see it. I could get any tougher. You got to make a living and you got to be the parent and you don't have a spouse. May God bless you. And uh, she had a bill she needed to pay and she didn't have the wherewithal. And somehow he found out about it. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It was, I'm talking about to the dollar. What I had given him and what he was about to give her, it was exactly what she owed. Does God know what he's doing or not? Amen. Amen. Now, some of y'all are saying, you made that up. Do you think I would lie from the pulpit? I wouldn't tell a lie anywhere, but I sure wouldn't do it up here. I don't even exaggerate. That's exactly how it happened. What am I trying to tell you? The amount you give back will determine the amount you get back, give out, but it's more blessed to give than to receive. And when I heard that testimony, I was so happy. I never even met the lady, and that's fine. Don't have to. But God promised, I'll strengthen you. I'll uphold you. And when you're in need, I will supply all your needs according to my riches in Christ Jesus. Do you need provision? Claim God's promise in Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with Jesus freely give us all things? Do you need protection? God can handle that. Claim his promise. I pray these verses every day for me and my kiddos and our grandchildren and their families. Psalm 91, verses 10, 11. No evil will befall us. No plague will come near our dwelling. You will give your angels charge concerning us to guard us in all of our ways. Pray that every day. Are you facing loneliness? You say you're by yourself. Are you a Christian? You're never by yourself. Never. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He'll be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Look at me. If you're saved, God is going ahead of you. He's blocking for you. If you're saved, simultaneously, He's with you. And if you're saved, He's got your back. He's all around you. All around you. Amen. Amen. I told you I was going to preach myself happy. Are you sick? He can heal you. He can heal you. Jeremiah 17, 14. Here's a promise. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are my praise. Oh, I got a problem, preacher. Get a promise. Get a promise for the one who can make a promise and keep it. God will never back down off of one of his promises. Well, because he holds you in his hand. I need to either get a softer pulpit or quit hitting it. I can tell you that. All right. (laughs) Because God holds you in his hands. You'll experience God's presence, God's promises. But because God holds you in his hand, you're going to experience God's power. Wow. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous, what hand? Say it out loud. Right Right hand. Oh, the right hand. Right hand. 
I've read about that in the Bible, that right hand, that prominent, powerful hand. That's the hand of strength. That's the hand Moses talked about in Exodus 15, verse 6. Your hand, your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Oh, I read about that right hand. That right hand is the hand of blessing. When God puts that hand on you, you've got the favor of God. Oh, yeah, I've read about that. Psalm 1611. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that right hand. It's the hand of protection and refuge. Yeah, I've read about that right hand. Psalm 17, verse 7. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against them. Boy, somebody comes after me, I just say, you know what? You're about to get hit by the righteous right hand of God. I'll try not to enjoy it. <laughs> Don't act so holy, all right, all right. Yeah. Then God's right hand is also righteous. Righteous right hand. Psalm 48, 10, your right hand is full of righteousness. Do you know where Jesus is sitting right now? Amen. Some of you know. He's at the right hand of the Father. There's no more blessed place in the whole universe than the right hand of the Father. Jesus did his work on this earth. He was born of a virgin. Free from a sinful nature. He lived a sinless life, though tempted in all ways like we are. He died an atoning death, paid the sacrificial, the sacrificial penalty for every sin you've ever committed, every sin I've ever committed. He was buried, but he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He walked out, and he rose from the dead, and he'll never die again. He appeared to his disciples. He went back to heaven. And when he went in, he put his blood on the covenant of the covenant on the mercy seat. And then he went up to the Father and said, it is done. It is finished. And he sat down. Why did he sit down? You don't sit down until the work is over. The work is over, brother. Jesus did everything the Father told him to do. And then he sat down. Hallelujah. That'll make a Baptist get happy. Amen. Psalm 110, verse 1. Read it with me. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's what's happening right now. The Lord said to my Lord. The Father said to Jesus, you just sit right there. You've done everything you need to do. You sit right there, Jesus, until I make every one of your enemies a footstool. You're going to put your feet on the devil's neck. You're going to put your feet on sin's neck. You're going to put your feet on the enemy's neck. Don't you worry, Jesus. I got this. You sit right there, son. Aren't you glad he's sitting on the throne? Amen? On the throne. Devil's not so big and bad. He's got a foot on him right now. I believe while I'm preaching that, Jesus is mashing on him a little bit more right now. Amen. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, finisher, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, you come to Jesus, God's holding you in his hand, and you'll experience God's power. The early church needed the power of God. They thought they could do everything, but they needed the Holy Spirit. They needed Him not just to be with them, they needed Him to be in them. That's what the day of Pentecost is all about. From that day forward, every believer, the Holy Spirit came to live within Him. It's one thing to God to be with you. It's another thing to God to be in you. And on the day of the Pentecost, after Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended to heaven, 
The Bible says, 10 days after, 50 days after he rose from the dead, 10 days after he ascended to heaven, the Spirit of God fell down upon them and they began to speak in tongues and they were speaking in languages and all of a sudden everybody around them that was visiting for the festival in Jerusalem heard them speaking the gospel in their own language. And the Bible says a big crowd gathered around the apostles and the 120 people that were in that prayer meeting. God doesn't have to have a big crowd. 120 praying folks, God can get a lot done with them. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And the Bible says that they ran and said to Peter, what's going on? We're hearing you. We know you don't live in our part of the world and we hear you talking about Jesus and the gospel in our own language. And Peter, who had denied Jesus three times, now he's full of the Holy Spirit, totally changed man. He gets up and the Bible says, he looked at them and said, listen to me. Woo, now we're talking. And he told them the gospel. And he said, you need to be saved. And the Bible says, the Spirit of God flowed through him. And are you ready for this? 3,000 people got saved. Let's give God praise. Amen. That's the power of God. And folks have been getting saved every day. Ever since. Don't you let the devil tell you, think, make you think how powerful he is. He's defeated. Amen. Jesus is powerful. Amen. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. We don't go out here just doing stuff on our own power. I'm not some superman. I don't have power in myself. You come up to me and touch me. You're not going to feel a bunch of power come out of me. But I got news for you. You let the hand of God touch you and you're going to feel the power of almighty God. He has power to save you, no matter what you've done. Yes. Yes. He can forgive your past yes. and give you a bright future. Yes. He can change your life. He can change the way you talk. Yes. Yes. He can change your speech. He can change the way you think. Yes. He can change the way you walk. Yes. He can change your family. Yes. He can change your marriage. He can change your situation. He can change every problem you've got. He's a God who can change. He's a God who is powerful. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. I'm not going to walk without power the rest of my life. I'm going to walk with the power of Almighty God. Well, 44 years ago, this past July, I was ordained to the gospel ministry. I'd been married one month, and a month later I got ordained to preach the gospel at my home church, First Baptist Dyersburg, about 80 miles up the road. And uh, church was filled that Sunday night, and Donna Jo was sitting next to me. She's been sitting next to me a long time. And I remember that very clearly. I remember especially the laying on of hands. When I was being ordained, the first set of hands that were laid on me were from Dr. Orr, who had been my pastor all my life. I didn't think there was anybody else that was a pastor. He's the only pastor I'd ever known. He laid his hands on me. That precious man of God said, 
Steve, I, I just want you to know I'm proud of you. Well, then a, another pair of hands got laid on me. Bob A.G., Dr. Orr had retired. Dr. A.G. had been the interim there at the church. Pastor and I, he laid his hands on me and said, Steve. And by the way, he had introduced me to Donna and done our wedding. He laid his hands on me and said, Steve, I just want you to know I'm proud of you. And then... I felt another hand. It was a hand that had worked hard plowing behind a mule during the Great Depression. It was a hand that went off to war and fought against Hitler in Japan to save America's freedom. It was a hand that had worked on a railroad for 40 years. It was a hand that had held me when I was a baby boy. It was a hand that spanked me when I needed it. It was a hand that told me how to, taught me how to mow yards, drive a car, change your own oil. Did you know you can change your own oil? Oh, we just go down here and we pay a thousand dollars and get it done. I do too. <laughs> but my daddy didn't. <laughs> he was he was tight with money. He carried two thousand dollars in his wallet all the time. And he carried the same two thousand dollars for forty years. <laughs> He never spent a penny of it. But his hands passed the usher, the offering plate. He was the head usher at our church. He told me how to shoot a gun, how to go hunting, how to bait a hook, how to go fishing. His hands taught me how to mow yards. His hand handed me the ring on my wedding day when I put it on Donna's finger. I knew those hands. And my dad wasn't very educated. And he was very shy. But I'll never forget what he said. He laid his hands on me. And he said, son, I sure am proud of you. I wouldn't take anything for that. I knew that hand. It spanked me when I needed spanking. It guided me when I needed guiding. And it blessed me when I needed blessing. And you look at me. Do you know Jesus Christ? How many of you know that you know Jesus Christ? You look at me. You look at me. God's hand is on you right now. God's hand is on you right now. Right now. He loves you. He cares for you. And his hand, he holds you in his hand. When Jesus holds you in his hand, you experience God's presence, God's promises, and God's power. Amen. You are not holding on to God. God is holding on to you. And he's not going to let you go. He loves you. God loves you. God will forgive you.
You say, well, I've done so many bad things. He still loves you. If you've been saved, he's not going to let you go. If you need to be saved, he's got his hand stretched out for you right now and said, come on, grab my nail-scarred hand. When I get to heaven, I want to grab hold of the hand of the railroader that raised me. I want to, want to grab hold of the hand of that janitor that helped raise me, my mom. I want to grab hold of my brother's hand. But more than anything, I'm looking forward to reaching out and touching that nail-scarred hand. And I believe, I believe he's not going to look at me and say, you sorry person, here was what you did. He's not going to talk like that. He's going to say, man, it's good to see you. I've been waiting for a long time. Let me show you heaven. He's going to walk all around, and I'm going to hold on for all eternity to the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take our hands and give him praise right now. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen.